Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of 2021 Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. My name is Mark Williams, and I'm your host for tonight's Fireside. And I hope that you had a fantastic holiday season and a very happy New Year celebration. And that this is, the because it's the first Sunday of the year, we hope that, that this is the start of your best year ever. So thank you so much for joining us for another Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. It's going to be a great one. So thank you so much for being with us. We'll get to the topping in just a few minutes, but before we get there, if you haven't already, please go to turtle.link slash app and download the Our Turtle House app. It's totally free and there's so much amazing content available for you from some of your favorite speakers like John By the Way, Hank Smith, Meg Johnson, and so many more. And right now you can listen to Meg Johnson's most recent Turtle Talk. It's a live recorded monthly message of inspiration and hope called Visions of Success, Accomplishing Goals and Reaching Your Dreams. It's all about how to set goals the, the gospel way. It's a, it's a blend of, of the spiritual principles of goal setting with the physical principles that actually help you to make them happen. So it's a great turtle talk. It's available for free through January 5th. So just a couple more days. So go check it out for free on the Our Turtle House app. We've got some amazing people who have reached out to us just over the last couple of weeks to let us know what, what their feedback is on these firesides. And we love hearing from you too. So if you've got ideas for future talks or future speakers that you'd like to hear from, go to turtle.link slash share and let us know your thoughts. Like Debbie, who says, I look forward to these firesides every Sunday. They are so uplifting and refreshing. Debbie, thank you so much for tuning in. We love putting on these firesides and are so glad that you're getting some inspiration and, and they're, helping, they're, they're helping to refresh your soul. So thank you so much for tuning in. We also heard from Hallie who says, I love the variety of amazing people that my family learns about through these firesides. Thank you for lighting the world during this difficult time. Hallie, thank you so much for tuning in. And we're so glad that these firesides are helping you and your family. And just like Hallie and Debbie, if you've got ideas for future firesides and topics, let us know. We want to hear it. This week's topic comes from Laura, who says, knowing your self-worth. And it's a great topic, especially for the beginning of the year. And I know that you're going to love the speakers that we've got on tap today. Let me uh, go ahead and introduce them. First of all, We've got a motivational speaker who's passionate about teaching others the tools she's been using for years to conquer her negative self-talk, doubts, and fears so she could finally live her dreams. She loves helping others learn to gain more confidence, love themselves more, and live their dreams too. She's an author of the book, Consistent Steps Up, Conquering My Mountains of Negativity, and the children's book, Lawrence the Tailless Wonder. Her talented 13-year-old son illustrated them, which is kind of a fun fact. She enjoys spreading daily positivity across social media in her Facebook group, Wendy Motivates. After working with teens as a residential at, at a residential treatment center and now working in a junior high school, it's given her a greater desire to teach and to help teens in any way she can. She served a mission in Korea and loves the food, language, people, and culture. Her role as a mother to her miracle son and as a wife to her talented husband, though, are the most important things that she does. Let's welcome Wendy Tatton. Hi. Wendy, how are you doing? It's so good to, to be with you today, tonight. This is great. I'm excited. And I hope I said your last name right. Tat Tatin. Tatin. Correct. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> good. I sometimes I, I've lived in Utah long enough. Sometimes I forget my T's. So thank, I'm glad that I said it right. <laughs> good. Thank you. <laughs> well, so pleased to, to have you with us. We'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker, who's a sought after leader of transformational change. She works with women and teen girls to help them discover the pain, trauma, depression, and anxiety they store within their bodies and resolve it. She guides them to create a spirit, a space of healing, connection, and love in order to become who they were truly meant to be in this life as they step into their divine purpose. She's a best-selling author and is the CEO of Reclaiming Light. She lives with her husband and five kids in the Pacific Northwest, and she loves hosting retreats and collecting sea glass with her kids on the beaches. She, in her free time, she, facil she facilitates a homeschool co-op for her children and seven, several others. She's passionate about creating opportunities and a space for change for women to understand their self-worth. You can find more about her or connect with her at reclaiminglight.com. Let's welcome Tiffany Lovell. Tiffany, how are you doing? Hey, Great. Tiffany. Thank you. Hi. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for joining us. This is going to be, well, first off, I love the Pacific Northwest and there's nothing like collecting sea glass. It's so cool. I know. It's our favorite. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And uh, this is going to be great. Let's go ahead and introduce our final speaker. Our final speaker, after a 20-year retirement from his collegiate track and field career, he felt an inexplic inexplicable compulsion to step back on the track and get to work. Reluctantly at first, he answered that strange call. 
Four years later, he became the oldest sub four minute and 20 second miler in history. An inspirational le leadership speaker, author, and executive coach. He recently set master's track world records for the mile, 300 meter, and steeplechase. And through this painful journey, he has become more and more fully introduced to himself. He lives in Spanish Fork with his wife and their children. He gardens, is a passionate honeybee keeper, and serves as a ward gospel doctrine instructor. Let's welcome Brad Barton. Brad, how are you doing, my friend? Hey, Brad. Hi. <laughs> This is this is so great. I'm so excited to have all of you on here. This is I think this is the first time that that you've been with us here on an Art Turtle House Digital Fireside. So thank you so much for for joining us. Let's get right to it and and start with an opening prayer. Uh, Tiffany, will you will you uh, do that for us? I will. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather tonight. We're grateful to be able to share the messages and to able to inspire and lift those around us. We pray that the spirit will be with us and that those who have prepared to speak will be able to deliver their messages with love and with the spirit. We pray for the safety of those around us and that as we embark on this new year, that we will have hope and peace and that we will look to thee. We pray for these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, we'll go ahead and get right to it with our first speaker, who is Wendy. Wendy, thank you again so much for being with us. Did you have a good New Year's and holiday, Christmas, everything? It's, it's been so quiet and relaxing and stress-free. I've had, a, I've loved it, loved it. Oh, I, I get you. This this year, well, 2020 has has just been obviously sure. so different in so many ways, but there's been a lot of things that I've kind of loved about it. And I agree, The like Christmas and Thanksgiving were Definitely different, but kind of nice. Kind of nice, yeah. with just a little quieter. You know, <laughs> fewer people and everything. I missed. I missed the people that I would normally spend holidays with. But but it, right. was, it was great. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> true. Very true. I agree. Well, I'm excited to hear what you have to share with us. Go ahead and take it away, my friend. All right. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be speaking and sharing my my experiences and my journey with you tonight. Um, well, here we are, as we said, in a new year, and that brings us a fresh start and new hopes. And after the year we've had, we can all use some more hope, right? Um, uh, a new year also brings with it many worldly messages about, you know, from social media and friends and work and everything like that, that a new year requires you to be a new you. And um, basically it's always, you need to change those worldly things about you. That's what the world's saying, right? Well, you don't have to buy into those messages. We all struggle with feelings of low self-worth at times in our lives because the world wants us to judge ourselves um, by many different and difficult standards. But in the end, our worth has nothing to do with how much we cross off our to-do lists, um, what possessions we own, who our friends are, or even what our talents are, right? That has nothing to do with our self-worth. In Doctrine and Covenants 18.10, it actually says, remember, the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Our divine worth is infinite. It never changes. And it comes from who we are, divine children of our Heavenly Father. And He loves us no matter what. So it's not our self-worth that changes. It's actually our sense of self-worth. Um, we do not have to let our self-worth be determined by others, only by God and by ourselves. So it's important to understand how to recognize all these false messages that are coming at us and then be able to combat those messages. So knowing my self-worth um, or my sense of self-worth is a roller coaster. Um, it's a roller coaster ride that I've been on most of my life. And there are times when I know my worth and I know who I am and I'm on the top of that roller coaster, right? I'm on the top of that hill. And then um, there are times when I question my worth and I'm back down at the bottom of that hill. And I think it's human nature. Uh, the trick is not to sit down at the bottom of your roller coaster and get stuck there for too long because it's really, really hard to build that momentum to get back up that hill again. Um, we have to look up and we have to start moving up our hills quickly. 
And hopefully some of my experiences that I share today will help you with that. Um, I wanted to share my roller coaster ride and what I've learned from it. So I have a confession to make. I was a bully. Um, I said horrible, mean, terrible things. I was ruthless. But I did not say it to anybody but myself. Um, I was kind to others. I had lots of friends. But the things I said to myself, I would not say to my worst enemy. Um, the things I said to myself were mostly in my head, but every once in a while they would come out of my mouth and the people who heard those unkind things, um, they would try to make me feel otherwise, but I wouldn't listen to them. I went right on being unkind to myself. Have you ever done this to yourself? Have you been your own worst bully? We say bullying is so bad, but we don't realize how much we're doing it to ourselves. Well, as a teenager, um, I got a job in a bakery and everyone there called me the sunshine queen. <laughs> I put on a really good act. Um, I had to be happy at my job because I liked my job and I wanted to keep it. And I tried to love myself because that was what I was taught. And every Sunday in church, I would stand up with the young women I and I would say, we are daughters of a heavenly father who loves us and we love him. I was taught about my individual worth and I tried to figure out um, what that was. Um, and I tried to love myself more and I tried to figure out who I was. And at that time I didn't know. When I was in junior high and high school, I was actually very terrified to put myself out there. I never tried out for anything. Uh, the only thing I joined was um, Future Homemakers of America in my senior year of high school. Um, but I, I really didn't put myself out there because I was too scared of what everyone thought about me. I was worried about them. And realistically, they probably weren't thinking about me at all. So it was all in my head. I compared myself to everyone, which never ended well. My senior year, after much coaxing from friends, um, I actually tried out for our school musical and I got in which was very surprising to me, right? I got in and the musical, and after a few weeks, um, I dropped out because I didn't think I was good enough. They obviously thought I was good enough or they wouldn't have put me in, right? But I didn't think I was good enough, so I dropped out. And I was so mad at myself for doing that. Um, and the interesting thing is that back then in junior high school, my my life's dream was to be a mentor and a motivational speaker and an author. But I was actually terrified to do all of those things. So guess what stopped me from pursuing my dreams? Yep, my horrible bullying self, right? I was bullying myself, all my negative self-talk, and my comparing myself to others, that's what stopped me from pursuing that. When I was in college, um, before my mission, I compared myself to others all the time. And because of that, I never really felt good about myself. Now, I always knew that I was supposed to go on a mission and I was so excited and so terrified <laughs> when I got my call to Korea Seoul, the Korea Seoul West mission. Um, I had done some traveling outside of the United States, so I wasn't quite as scared as I think I would have been if I'd always been in Utah. But um, all my memories from my mission are happy and good and I loved my mission and I met so many wonderful people and I learned so many lessons that will stick with me forever. Well, when I decided to write my book, I started to go back and read my journals and my mission journals to find some good stuff to include in this book that I was writing. And as I read, I was so shocked to um, see how much negativity was in my journals and how mean I was to myself and how I was bashing myself all the time that I couldn't learn the language and, and all this stuff. And um, I did have good stories and good things in there every once in a while, but I, it really saddened me to see how much negativity there was. And those are my journals that I don't know if I want anyone to read, right? Um, because they were so negative. And when I got home from my mission, I decided that I wanted to work on 
becoming an author and a motivational speaker and a mentor again. So I took lots of communications classes, English classes, um, public peak, sp- but sorry, <laughs> public speaking classes um, in college. And once again, um, that comparison and that negative self-talk um, stepped back in and it stopped me from pursuing that dream. My sense of self-worth went downhill. I was back down at the bottom of my roller coaster. And um, I, I got a job as a manager of a bookstore, which I really liked. And I ended up being there for over three years. So as I was nearing 28 and two of my sisters were um, already married, I just knew that I was going to be the spinster with lots of cats. Minus the cats, because I'm allergic. But um, (laughs) I just knew I was going to be that spinster. Um, One day, I met an old friend of mine from the Institute Choir that we had been in, and we hit it off. Um, We started dating, we got engaged, and we got married in the Ogden Temple. So I I didn't have to worry about being the spinster anymore. Um, A year after we were married, I was let go from that job that I loved at the bookstore. And we had a house and two car payments, and I was desperate. Excuse me. I was willing to take any job that I could at that point. Luckily, I managed to find a job that with a really good company, um, great pay, great benefits. But deep down, I knew that I did not want to sp- spend a lot of time at that job. I didn't want to stay there very long because I wanted to pursue my dream again at some point. Well, uh Let's see. My husband and I, the first um, three years of our marriage were horrific. We had some horrible struggles that we went through. And when we decided to finally start our family, that brought on two more years of pain and trials. We lost three dear babies, and I felt of no worth because I could not have a baby. I was so heartbroken. I was at the bottom of my hill again, and I stayed there for a very, very long time. (laughs) Heavenly Father loves us, though. Uh, He knows what we need. And we were so blessed and eventually had our miracle son. He's amazing. I love him. Um, And at that point, I started feeling good about myself again, and I was still working at my job. Um, But while I was at work, our son was being watched by someone I trusted and loved. And so I didn't feel so bad about being a working mom. Um, But there were moments of the, I'm not a good enough mom. I'm not a good enough wife. Does any of this sound familiar to anyone? Nobody else does that but me, right? (laughs) Nobody. Um, Anyway, I, after being at that job for 13 years, when I wasn't going to stay out very long, right? Um, I was not happy. And I had forgotten my dreams. And I didn't feel like I was contributing to the world at all. Um, I didn't feel like I had much worth. I had forgotten who I was. And I was so tired of being on this roller coaster ride. Every morning on the way to work, I would pray. I would ask Heavenly Father, what I could do to help him, to help myself, and to help his children. One day, he reminded me of my dreams. I had forgotten what they were. And this time, I knew I could not not quit pursuing my dreams again. I had to see it through. So then, every day, I continued praying for his help to figure out how I was going to accomplish this huge, huge goal. He listened to me and he put people, books, experiences, so many things in my life that taught me so much. I worked hard and these things helped me to change and grow and gain confidence in my abilities. And I learned to love myself more. Well, after 15 and a half years, I finally left that job. 15 and a half years. 
um, to, to finally go live my dream. It was scary, but it was so, so worth it. I have been able to speak to some inc incredible groups of people. I have mentored people who have made amazing changes in their lives. And it's been so rewarding to be a witness to it all. And in 2020, um, I had two books that I wrote that became available on Amazon. So I'm living my dreams and it's, it's amazing. Now, I can truly say that I love myself. I know my worth. I know I'm a daughter of Heavenly Father and I know he loves me. Because of my journey, my sense of self-worth is at the top of the hill. I feel so good about myself and my life and about the things that I've accomplished and the things I'm working on now. Now, I'm not saying that you have to do what I did to gain positive feelings about your self-worth. We all have different purposes and we all have different journeys that we are on. So finding our purpose with God is a huge part of helping us feel good about our own self-worth. There's an anonymous quote that says, the meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose of life is to give it away. And I so believe that. Even now, <laughs> where I'm in such a good place with my self-worth, I, I believe the first minute that I do have struggles um, sometimes with my self-worth, right? We all do, but, but I can work through those times a lot faster than I was ever able to before. I was so excited when I was asked to speak today or speak for this um, uh, turtle talk. I was so excited. Um, but when I was asked to write my bio so that I could be introduced and provide a picture, I struggled. Um, I started reading bios of those who had done the, these turtle talks in the past. and. Um, and I started to compare and I started to think I wasn't good enough to do this. And then I started looking at the pictures and I thought, oh, my picture needs to be better. I need it needs to be more professional. Maybe I need to go to go get some some more pictures taken. And I started getting really frustrated with myself. and I was scared and I put myself down and I said to my husband, huh, I don't think I can do this. And he was very encouraging. But I didn't listen to him <laughs> as well as I listened to the other voice, the master of discouragement. Then I prayed about it. I told Heavenly Father why I wanted to do this and how I wanted to help. I asked what I should do and I listened. And the words that came to me were, just be you. You know who you are. The feeling that came to me was one of peace and comfort. Just be you. You know who you are. I do know who I am. So I quit comparing and the next day I updated my bio. I picked a picture that made me feel really good and happy when I looked at it and I emailed them off. And this mini self-worth struggle taught me some valuable lessons and it only took me a few hours to move through instead of a few weeks or months like ones I've went through in the past. I got through it because of the tools that I've learned to help me and make me stronger in knowing who I am. I also got through it with his help, with his help, <laughs> because I prayed to him and he reminded me once again of who I was. Sorry. Whew. One of Satan's biggest tools that he uses is to, to try and destroy us is comparison. It's that I'm not enough. I'm not good enough, I'm not skinny enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not handsome enough. Whatever it is, he uses that to try to destroy us. And when we start having these thoughts, if we let them stay in our heads, they can lead to self-destruction. Stop it now. Don't compare. I know that's easier said than done. How do you stop? How do you stop these things? Well, these are the things I learned to help me build myself up, to know and to have a greater sense of my self-worth. By doing these things, I was able to control my thoughts and actions and I was able to stop comparing. The first one is obviously pray. Pray to know who you are and pray for guidance to fulfill your purpose. He will answer you. 
He loves you and he wants you to know he loves you. As part of his prayer, President Harold B. Lee used to say, oh God, help me to hold a high opinion of myself. I love that. Help me to hold a high opinion of myself. Show gratitude. The source of all things is the Lord and thus we should show gratitude to him. Showing gratitude to the Lord helps us better see our worth in his sight. Now, this is my gratitude journal, and um, I have been writing in a gratitude journal for the past four years. It's just a notebook from the dollar store, and I put three things in it every day that I am grateful for. And then in the back, the next thing is to speak kind words, words to yourself. So I have written affirmations, and I have I put some on cards and put little sparklies on them, and um, I have all sorts of affirmations in here, and every day I speak those affirmations to myself. I pick some and I say them out loud because I need to hear kind words from myself. And even as a family, um, we say affirmations together at night before bed so that we can um, have those good thoughts going through our head before, you know, while we're sleeping, right? And between the positive affirmations and my gratitude journal, those are two things that have helped me so much. And those are journals that I would love people to read because I want them to know how grateful I am for everything Heavenly Father's given me. Um, The next one is focus on your future. Repent of past sins. Don't stay in the past, right? Don't stay in the past. Repent of your sins and move forward. The next one is to serve others and improve yourself. Look for the good in yourself and also for the good in others. Um, We sometimes get so caught up in in fixing ourselves, right? We have to be careful with improving that, improving ourselves because we become so focused on us that we forget everyone else, right? And we we need to remember everyone else too because there's lots of people that we could be helping and serving. So improve yourself, but also make sure you're serving others. And I love this one because I've been able to accomplish so many goals. You set a big realistic goal Break it down into little tiny small goals that you can work on every single day to work towards that goal. Remember, consistency is key. You have to do something every single day to get you to work, get you towards your goal so you can accomplish it. The next one, celebrate your successes, even the small daily ones, and celebrate other people's successes too. Don't be jealous if someone has a success. Celebrate with them and do something different. Routine and boredom can make our life seem discouraging. Change things up a little, plant something, learn to cook, read a book, write a letter to someone, build something, go somewhere you've never been. Do something different, just do something different. As a child of God or as children of God, we can also feel his love, which should be another huge boost to your self-worth. President Monson said, Your Heavenly Father loves you, each of you. That love never changes. It is not influenced by your appearance, by your possessions, or by the amount of money that you have in your bank account. It is not changed by your talents or your abilities. It is simply there. It is there for you when you are sad or happy, discouraged or hopeful. God's love is there for you whether you whether or not you feel you deserve his love. It is simply always there. Knowing and feeling your self-worth is not about bragging about what you have or what you own or what you've done. It's not about conforming to the world's view of what self-worth is. It is about being you. You know who you are. I know who you are. You are a child of Heavenly Father and he loves you. When you truly understand this, you will gain lasting self-worth that is better than anything the world has to offer. I know this to be true. And I'm so grateful for the journey I've been on trying to figure out my own sense of self-worth. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Wendy. I love 
I love that message. And I thought, I think you kind of shared a quote about it, but I think that one of the greatest gifts that we can give, not to just ourselves, but to others is to love ourselves. Yes. You know, it's a uh, savior said, or the, the, the two greatest commandments are to love God and to love our neighbor as ourself. And I think sometimes we forget that as ourself part, you know, that in order for us to love other people as much as we can, we, we got to love ourselves too. So it's, we can't sure. just forget ourselves. I love that. Thank you so much for, for sharing that today. Thank you. I appreciate it too, the idea or the analogy of the roller coaster. I think that's really a powerful way to look at that, that we don't ever stay, we don't stay at the top, the roller coaster, I mean, hopefully, right? <laughs> hopefully the, the roller coaster doesn't stay stuck here. <laughs> but also that it continues to move and that's where the joy is at. You don't feel the exhilaration on the roller coaster when it's just paused and, and stopped, but you feel it as it moves and it continues to flow. And that's exactly how our life is. So I love that you shared that. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy, I, I really love the, the, your vulnerability when you talk about being um, your own meanest bully. And I really identify with that because I was, I was that bully too. I was a bully to myself. Mm -hmm. And I had a coach in high school, very thankfully, that taught me a, a wonderful principle. He said, if you want to change your story, oh, and I badly wanted to change my story. He said, then you've got to change your stories. Yeah. Right. If you want to change your story, you've got to change your stories. That, that's a message for all of us. That's now, here's awesome. this wonderful um, old Greek Orthodox Catholic that, that, that taught me this, this true message um, it, that we find in the Bible in different words. Uh, a pithier way to say it is what we say more of, we see more of. Right. And, and so I really love this, this notion that you, your, your story, it, it was really part of it was a story of, of overcoming the, and telling less bad stories and less good ones or more good ones, less ugly stories, more beautiful ones. Yeah. And that's something that, that I really identified with as well. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I love that. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts and being so vulnerable and open about your experience and, and uh, helping us all understand how we can know our self-worth more, more than we do today. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. You're so well, welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll go ahead and, and move to our next speaker of the evening, which will be Tiffany. Tiffany, I got to say, how, how is life up in the Pacific Northwest right now? <laughs> Uh, it's like very it's chilly. There, but. <laughs> it is a little. It is a little chilly. Oh. Yes, but it's beautiful. We love I was it. Say, even still, it's it's still. My parents live up there. I've got some siblings that actually half of my siblings live up there, and it's just, oh, yeah. it's so beautiful. I love it up there. It's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, oh, for yeah. sure. It's it's been our favorite place of all the places we've lived. We love being oh. by the ocean. Oh so. yeah, that's that's awesome. What where else have you lived? Um, so we've lived in Colorado. We've lived in New Mexico. We actually RV'd for a year up the coast of California and Oregon. And we landed in Washington just planning to be there for the summer. And it didn't rain the whole time we were there. So we thought everybody is lying. Like it does not rain in the Pacific Northwest. So we put down roots. We got a job. We got a house. And then it started raining. And it oh hasn't stopped God. raining since we got there. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> they 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 snaked you in. They're like, yeah, they sure oh, did. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> yep. Oh, I yeah. love it. Well, I'm so excited yeah. to what you have to share to hear what you have to share with us. Go ahead and take it away, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. I am so grateful to be here tonight. I'm grateful to be able to share this message because this is actually one I teach and I share every single day. The idea of self-worth and how do we improve that and how do we make it better? How do we have more of it? Um, and then how do we help our children? And so I was kind of gathering some of my thoughts and some things to put together for you know tonight to be able to share. And I went on to a psychology website and wanted to get some definitions of self-worth and self-esteem, self-confidence, things like that. So I'm going to share this with you. This is from a popular psychology website, but it says self-worth is an individual's subjective evaluation of their own worth. It encompasses beliefs about oneself as well as emotional states such as triumph, despair, pride, and shame. So I read this and I thought, this is very textbook. This is very, um, 
impersonal. This doesn't really help me to help others with this. And so I decided I'm going to go talk to Heavenly Father. I'm going to ask him, what do you want me to share? How can I open up the opportunity for people to know their worth? And as I was praying, Heavenly Father said, tell them about your exit interview. Okay, well, I'm going to share. I'm going to tell you about my exit interview. So I served a mission in North Carolina. And um, as I'm sure most people who serve missions, there is an exit interview at the end of the mission. And for me, my parents had come out to pick me up. And um, I, my, I took a grand piano home from my mission, which is another story entirely of itself. But I, anyway, so they came out to pick up this grand piano and to bring me home. And so they're waiting out in the, the foyer of the mission office. And I'm having this exit interview. And that's the place where the mission president talks to you about your last 18, 20, 24 months, whatever it is, and asks, how did you do? How did you feel you did? You know, what, what did you love about it? What was challenging? And now what are you going to do because of this experience? And he gives you some guidance and gives you some direction. And as I was sitting in that exit interview, hearing the things that my mission president is telling me as I prepare to start a new journey, I had this overwhelming sense of, familiarity, familiarity. <laughs> it was familiar. And I realized I had been in an interview like this before. I had been in a place where I had had an exit interview before, and it wasn't with a mission president, and it wasn't with my stake president as I'm leaving. It was with my Heavenly Father. I had an exit interview before I left his presence to come down here. And that's where he gave me guidance and he gave me some direction and he told me what he wanted me to know before I got down here. So as I was thinking about tonight and how I was going to share things with you and about this exit interview, I was thinking about what Heavenly Father did not say to me or to any one of you in that exit interview. So I'm going to share some of those, what he did not say. He did not tell me or you that our worth would be defined by our to-do list. He didn't say, Tiffany, if you do these things on your to-do list, then you'll be worthy. Then I will love you more. Then I will love you. He did not say, Tiffany, whatever job you have, that will determine how much I love you. This is all going to be based on your job. He didn't say that. He also did not say, and this is what I talk to teenagers a lot about when I'm working with them, that my worth would be defined by my social media status, by how many likes I got, how many comments, how many followers. It would not be measured by that. Can you imagine Heavenly Father saying, when you reach 1 million views or when you reach 100,000 likes, then you'll be worthy to be with me. Then I'll love you. Heavenly Father did not tell us that our worth would be determined by our age. That if we were young, then we would be more worthy. If we were older, we'd be more seasoned and then we would be worthy. He did not compare or he did not um, say that our worth would be determined by others. That whatever they thought of us, that's what he would think of us. Whatever they said about us, that's what he would believe would be truth. Heavenly Father didn't say that. He didn't, he didn't put those terms into our self-worth. I love this because I just learned that um, Brad is a runner and this is on my list, but Heavenly Father did not say that our worth would be determined on how far you can run. And I am so grateful because Brad would be so, so far ahead of me and I would be so far behind. But my worth isn't determined on how far I can run. And Heavenly Father is not measuring his love for me based on that. It's not based on my grades. I got a C in geometry. I didn't really super try. And in one of my other classes, I took donuts to school every Friday, and that's how I passed that class. So I'm pretty grateful that my worth and his love for me is not based off my grades. It's not based off the number of friends you have. It's not based off your relationship status. It's not based on how much money you have in the bank or how much money you don't have in the bank. It's not based off of your likes or interests. Heavenly Father didn't say, if you like these things, then you're worthy. If you like these things, mm, it's not looking good for you. He didn't say that. It's not about anything or anyone but yourself. And he gave us one thing to be able to measure our self-worth on. 
in first Samuel 16, seven, it says, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. Good thing. Cause I'm not very tall because I've refused him for the Lord seeth not as man seeth for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So as I was sitting in this exit interview with my mission president and having this like experience where it was so familiar that I was having an exit interview with my heavenly father, I realized that the one thing that heavenly father planted inside of me that would measure my worth was my heart. It says right here, the Lord looketh on the heart. That's where he determines our worth. That's where we determine our worth. It's so easy to get caught up in what other people are doing, what other people look like, how other people are dressing, what they're saying, how they're showing up in their life and where we are. I don't know about you, but in 2020, I wore more pajama pants <laughs> to work than I ever had before. I it was easy to be able to look at how others were being so successful in different areas um, and living their best life during the 2020 year. But there wasn't a lot of vulnerability in what was being shared. And there were things that were hard that were being expressed, but there wasn't a lot of rawness. And for me, I experienced a lot of challenging things during 2020. My kids had their friendships and their teachers taken from them. They had their normal routines taken from them. I was in at the cusp of growing some really big things within my organization and my company. And suddenly having kids home again meant altering all of this. And there was loss of my own friendships and my own connections at church because of distance. And there was a lot of grief and it felt very easy to fall into a place where this is as good as it gets. This is, this is who I am. This is where I'm at and not be able to move out of that space. As, as Wendy talked about those roller coasters, it was so easy to be at the bottom of that. And I have many clients who not only have touched the bottom, but they've stayed at the bottom for a very, very long time. And so I decided to do an experiment and I was going to try on a word of, of a self-worth word for a day and see what happened. And my word was beautiful. So I woke up in this particular morning, like I'd planned to do this. And it was all about what would beautiful do? What would she say today? What would she wear? How would she show up? Who would she interact with? How would she carry herself? What would it look like if beautiful led the show today? And so I got up and I stepped into what would beautiful wear? All of those things. And I got to school. I run a co-op, a homeschooling co-op. And I was working with this group of kindergarten boys. I have four rowdy kindergarten boys in my class. And one of the little boys who is not super personal about, about things, we're sitting there working and he looks over at me and he says, teacher, you're really beautiful today. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like, is this real? Like he used my word. I didn't even, I wasn't, I didn't tell anybody about this experiment. Here's this five-year-old boy who has never given me a compliment or said anything like that. If anything, it was more about let's keep this little person in his chair and, and be on task. But he felt it. He felt my intention. He felt how I was showing up in my worth. So I kept going. School ended and I got home. I wasn't wearing anything, you know, super glamorous or anything. And I'm pretty sure I had my hair up in a bun on top of my head and probably didn't even have my eyelashes on that day. But I got home and my husband came home for lunch and he wrapped his arms around me and he said, you just look so beautiful today. And again, number two, I was showing up as what would beautiful do? How would she act? How would she carry herself? It felt amazing to be in that space, but then to have people recognizing that that's exactly what I was putting out around me, that was amazing. So then I thought, okay, well, this is two. If it happens again, then I'm gonna know that this is really not a fluke, that this is really my intention and people are feeling my worthiness of myself and it's trickling out. 
So I was at Target and I was shopping. I was doing a little bit of, I was with a friend and of course we have our masks on. And so you can only see from here up and I'm over in the dollar spot section, which I get sucked into far too often. And I am looking at things and there's a mom pushing a cart and she's got a little boy inside the cart and he was probably, I don't know, four or five years old, a little big to be sitting in that front thing. His legs were dangling. And he said to his mom, mom, look at that lady. She's so beautiful. And I, I can't fully express to you what that moment felt like. It was the third un, like planned situation. That child had no idea what I woke up attempting to do that day to live in a space where no matter what anybody else thought about me, no matter what the world said I should look like during the middle of a pandemic, no matter who anybody else thought I should be, I was going to show up beautiful. And for the third time in a row, someone recognized it simply because I chose, I chose to be in that spot. Um, I think that this can trickle out into anything. Maybe beautiful isn't your word, but maybe your word is peace. How would peace show up today? What would peace do? What would peace say? What would peace wear? How would it, you know, have a conversation with a spouse or a child? It could be confidence. It could be um, anything that you want to feel, you get to step into that. How would certainty, how would gratitude show up? You get to choose. Because our bodies are physical, and because they have like tangible parts about them, we have these five senses that so much of what happens in our life tends to be led by our five senses. So what we see and what we feel and hear and taste and touch, we get to be able to decide, are those things all truth? When I look in the mirror and I see, ugh, is that really truth? Or when I look in the mirror and I see, nice. <laughs> She's looking good today. Is that truth? Which one of those feels like it's truth? And for me, taking my hand and putting it on my heart, because this is a physical body that needs physical reminders, and being able to tune into that part of me that God planted truth into, which is my heart. Remember the scripture said, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. When I touch my heart and I have those thoughts of, gosh, I'm just not good enough. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that again. Oh, I'm never, I shouldn't, I can't. And I touch my heart and I ask, is this truth? And I hear the answer and maybe the answer is still, yes, I am clumsy. Then I ask again, is this God's truth? And the answer is always no. For those negative things, it's not true. Those negative things are not what God planted inside of me. What God planted inside of me is love and peace and joy and connection. And it's my choice to step into those things. He's given me the gifts. I get to open them and I get to use them. I know that God wants us to remember. I know that he wants us to remember who we are, what, what he gave us. I know that he wants us to remember that exit interview. And whatever those promises were, whatever those covenants were that we made with him, whatever those instructions were that he sent us down here for and with, I know that he wants us to remember that. I know he wants us to remember the worth of our souls. As the scripture was shared earlier, the worth of our souls is great in his sight. And I know that that matters to him, that we discover that worth and we step into that. Of this, I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Tiffany, I love how you put that in terms of an exit interview. I mean, that's such a cool, that's such a cool idea. And a thought that came to mind while you were talking about that is just how sometimes, you know, at least for me, the mind chatter gets so loud that like Wendy said too, it's like I've become my biggest worst critic and kind of mm -hmm. tear myself down. But uh, some, just like you talked about, it's it's almost like just remembering what what's truth and what direction am I am I facing? Like if mm -hmm. as long as I'm continuing to face the Savior, it doesn't matter where I'm at or how much success or how little success I've had. But as long as I'm facing the Savior, I'm on the right track. And yeah, I love I love how you put put things in those terms. Thank you so much for sharing that today. Well, I, I love the 
the self-worth word, you know, stepping into that. I have a I have power word of, of brave because everything I'm doing is scary. So I have to be brave, but I need to change that word up every once in a while and experiment with those words because that is powerful. That's such an amazing story that people could see what you were trying, not necessarily even trying, but you were wanting to portray with your self-worth word. That's awesome. I'm going to get more with that. Thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. Tiffany, you kind of queued up what I have to say as well. Um, this notion that God did not say, if you do whatever, if you accomplish, if you, if you can perform, then I'll love you. That's false doctrine, isn't it? Um, yeah. The, the Lord looketh upon the heart and just love that. And then this, this notion that, you know, what I talked about before with Wendy's comments, um, if we want to change our story, then we've got to change our stories. Yeah. Is it possible to have a one word story? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Your story <laughs> was beautiful that day. And that that was manifest in your, in your mm -hmm. day, wasn't it? So yeah, yeah one word stories work just fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank for you. Well, Tiffany, thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts, your testimony, and for being with us on tonight's fireside. I know that I, just like with Wendy's talk, I've, I felt so uplifted and inspired by, by both of your words. So thank you so much for, for sharing your, for, for sharing everything tonight. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We'll go ahead and finish things off with our final speaker of the evening. Brad, how are you doing? Doing great. Thank you. Good. I'm so excited to have you with us. And and you've had quite the experience, just like we talked about in your bio, how you competed in on the collegiate level and then left for 20 years and then felt inspired to go back. And and what what a change. And you've been a, a, you've been able to accomplish some amazing things since then. Yeah. I, um, with some help. Yeah. I, I never say that I set a world record. It was my coach and I that did this. And uh, there was a lot of grace that went along as well. And that oh, actually okay. fits into the message that I have for us all to, to the, this evening. Perfect. Go ahead and take it away, my friend. I can't wait to hear it. Okay. Well, I was, um, as you said, I was a, a, a middle distance runner back in a different lifetime, <laughs> back in college at, at Weber State uh, University. And, um, and a good one. I was an NCAA All-American steeplechaser and um, uh, found myself uh, ranked, you know, pretty high in the world and had a chance to make the Olympic team after two failed attempts at making uh, the Barcelona games and the Atlanta games. Um, I got on with it and raising a family, building a speaking career and just having a blast, really. You know, life is hard. Uh, serving in the church just had a had a wonderful experience. And then um, just as life was going along splendidly, um, I had two things that happened that I never could have supposed. One was a family tragedy that had some really far reaching effects. And um, it, it's kind of complicated and beyond the, the scope of what we're doing here, but that, you know, devastating. Um, just about a year before that or a year or two before that, I had this other crazy thing happen. I felt inexplicably called back to the track you know i remember buying uh, track spikes and the clerk was saying well who you, who tell me about the kiddo that you're buying these for and i was embarrassed that, oh, these are actually for me i mean i had no idea why i was doing this but i knew i had to do it so as as uh, wendy and, and tiffany were telling their stories did you see did you hear your story in their story and the same for me um with the stories that i'm going to be telling you I'd like, to, I'd like you to put yourself, your version of, of the stories that I'm telling. Um, have you been called? Have you ever felt called to do something and you knew you had to do it? And then did you have the courage to actually answer that call? Well, um, I got back on the track and, and um, I thought, well, I got to have a goal if I'm going to do this. I'm 44 years old. Maybe I can break a five minute mile. I ran 4.43 in the mile, and then I ripped my quad muscle, took months to heal. The next year, I ran 4.32 after working even harder, and then I ripped my quad muscle, took months to heal. And if you toss up an image wit, um, then I called my old retired college coach, Chick Hislop. This is a, the Olympic coach in, in Atlanta. Um, he's a USA Track and Field Hall of Fame coach. He's a pretty amazing man. And I said, Coach, I ran 4.32 in the mile last year. He says, he says, what's the world record? And it's 420.19. I 
man named John Hinton ran a mile. And for most of you, that's just a number. But think about it. Four minutes, 20 seconds at, at 45 years old. <laughs> and I said, what do you think, coach? He says, I think it's time to come out of retirement. Let's get together and let's test the bounds of, of what is humanly possible to do with an aged athlete. Let's go break this, this 420 mile world record. And so uh, we started working together in 2012. Um, after four months of working together, I, I ran a 426. Two weeks later, 423. Two weeks later, I broke my foot. Actually, coach broke my foot. He just overworked me. And so I've got a, I'm on a, um, I got a broken foot and I'm very discouraged. And, and coach says, well, um, we got to reinvent what it means to train at a world-class level. And, uh, and that's what we did. It was, it, it was a hard slog, but in 2013, I ran 426, uh, a week later, uh, 421 in Boston, two weeks later, our first real attempt at the, the 420 record, um, with a terrible head cold, I ran 424, um, one last shot, Cornell, Ithaca. And in the second, the second lap of this race, I fell, I got tripped up and fell separated my shoulder. It was a devastating fall. I jumped up, tried to finish that race. I did. Um, I was just devastated. It was all this work for nothing. I mean, what, what was this all about? When I finally could walk on my own again, it was a very difficult experience. I found my way to a, a stairwell. Now, as I tell this, I'd like you to think about where your stairwell is and who did you call? But I called my coach and I was emotional. You know, I just worked for all these years and now I had no, no chance. It was over. You know, this, this call that I had been given, that I had answered and tried so hard to, to, to fulfill, it was, a, it was a failure. And I called my coach on the phone and I said, Coach, I can't do this. It's too hard. And my coach fires back. If this was easy, it would have already been done. <laughs> And I knew he was right. I knew he was right. So once again, recall your stairwell moment um, when you made that call, you know, maybe to God saying, hey, I can't do this. This thing that you've called me to do, to go back to school while I'm working two jobs and raising a family, you know, um, finding a mate, um, being able to live with the mate you have, whatever it is, deal with this teenager that's just gone seems like they're going crazy. This is too hard. I can't do this. And remember my coach's uh, uh, um, uh, plea to me, he says, if this was easy, it would have already been done. What's your version of that? This is supposed to be hard. This is part of introducing us to ourselves. Well, the, the story goes, um, he said, Brad, get back on a plane, get back to Ogden. We'll get Dr. Sharma, look at your shoulder. I'm going to call the Columbia coach and, and get you in that last chance meet up in, in uptown Manhattan. Brad, let's get it done two weeks from now at the armory. And uh, two weeks later, um, coach and I ran a, four, a mile in four minutes and 16 seconds and um, became the first uh, human being over 45 to run under 420 <laughs> in the <clears throat> in, in indoor mile. And that was a pretty cool experience. Um, a year later, I still felt like I was called because I, uh, we tried to do some other things later in the season. And, um, and so we up the, up the ante and, and ran a four, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 took nine seconds off the indoor 3000 meter world record, ran, ran a steeplechase in 2014. So fast, it would have won the biggest guy conference championship. <laughs> and then, um, I was almost 50. There's a new age group every five years, right? The 50 to 54 age. We, we figured that, that um, running that fast, that deep into the age group, we could do some great things in the, in the master's 50 um, age group, 50 to 54. So we tr I trained and I worked and I worked and I trained. I still felt like this was something I was supposed to do. And then the injury started happening. I shattered my toe months later. I ripped my quad months later, wicked head injury on a training run. Um, then I broke my foot in this another stress fracture. Then in a freak accident, I broke my toe. Then another wicked head injury in a training accident. 
And then I, and then I, and then I broke my foot again. I mean, it was just a, a year after year. I, I just I was in, why am I doing this? You might, you might toss up a, another image. Um, the devastation image <laughs> that I was, and people were talking about this. This is, these were very public uh, um, uh, humiliations too, because, because people not, they weren't talking about Brad Barton. They were talking about this famous coach that had this old has been athlete that was going and do, doing really, really cool things. But guys, I, I stayed after it. My coach and I stayed after it. And uh, last summer, 2019, um, and this is the last image, um, uh, wit, um, I stepped on a track in Tennessee and uh, became the first 50 plus year old to run under 425. In fact, we were in four, uh, 419. <laughs> and it just, well, um, it kind of shocked the track and field world. And, it, and we've inspired a lot of people along the way. And I've come to discover myself along the way and my need for God's grace. And it's been a wonderful, terrible, amazing experience. One of the, the articles is written, um, 10 Times of San Diego. He, he titled it Brad Barton's Book of Job <laughs> after hearing my story from ceaseless injuries to world record at 53 years old. Folks, what if you're called to do something that's hard? Neil A. Maxwell says, only with revelation can we do the Lord's work according to his will, according to his way, and according to his timing. I was just listening to this morning in my morning devotional. Elder Charles Didier said, so it is not enough to search the scriptures to know the mind of the Lord. We must uh, follow that with an act of faith, an act of faith, accepting to do the will of the Lord by obeying his commandments before we can enjoy the blessings of the Lord. Um, the notion that we can earn our way to heaven with accomplishments, that's false doctrine. That's false doctrine. Uh, neither though, th think the opposite. Neither can we, posh if, can we postulate a loving God that demands nothing of us. You know, if we have a, a nice, safe, comfortable God who just wants us to profess belief and then, and then we're done. No, Joseph Smith said that without sacrifice, that we can never develop the faith necessary unto salvation. And I think that's just brilliant. Um, this speaks directly to our theme of knowing ourselves, coming to know our own true worth. Um, social scientist M. Scott Peck. This is amazing. Here's a man that, that believes in God, but he's not even a Christian that time he wrote the book, The Road Less Travel. He says, all of us who, this is amazing. All of us who postulate a loving God and really think about it will eventually come to a single idea. God wants us to become himself. We are growing towards Godhood. God is the goal of, edu of evolution. It is God who is the source of the evolutionary force and God who is his destination. This is amazing. And then he says, as soon as we believe it is possible for man to become God, we can never really rest for very long. Never say, okay, my job's finished. Um, and my work is done. We must push ourselves onto greater and greater wisdom, greater love, greater uh, effectiveness. By this belief, and I love this part, by this belief, we have committed ourselves onto an effort full treadmill of self-improvement and spiritual growth. The idea that God is actively measuring us so that we might grow up to be like himself brings us face to face with our own laziness. That's not God's way. If we, if we, if we um, uh, can face that laziness, answer the calls, um, Matthew 5, 48 says, be therefore perfect, right? Even as our father, which is in heaven, is perfect. He does want us to be like him. So we've got to face our laziness. Christ was called to fast for 40 days and nights. Why? So that he could discover who he was, maybe. Nephi was called to build a ship. God could have built the ship, but Nephi needed to do the building. He, became, he, he recognized who he was in the process. Ammon and his brothers were called to a very difficult mission. Why? God could have converted all those, those people. He converted his, his, his friend Alma. 
but he didn't com convert those Lamanites. He let uh, Ammon and, and his brothers do the work, right? Um, Peter was called to feed sheep. Jonah was called to, to, uh, to Nineveh. We are all called to, to read and study the Book of Mormon. Here's the thing. In that process, we come to know God, our Father. We also come to know how precious we are to him. And in the doing, we receive his precious grace. And then we discover who we really are. We discover our, our self-worth. Early saints were called to Zion's camp. Zion's camp was a failure. Or was it? How about all this wonderful man who came to know themselves along the way, that became the, 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 the future leaders of the church? God wants us to answer those difficult calls, right? And, and um, we're all on that difficult journey to discover who we are. There's work to be done in the world, work to be done in his kingdom, and it's not who we become. Here's, it's not who we become along the way. It's the person we discover was already us along that journey. That's who we discover and, and it all, we also discover our need <laughs> to, for grace. We realize that we're not enough. As we have the, 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 the courage to answer our call and come to face, face, face to face with our own doubts and discouragements and, and laziness, right? When we face our natural man, well, um, we've, we run our race. With a proper pace, it's not requisite that we run faster than we have strength, right? We also taste of his grace and we come to know ourselves, come to know our God and come to realize his need, uh, our need for his refining fire, his enabling um, and, and equipping grace. Um, second Nephi chapter five is this, a, it's really, reread it. It's amazing. Chapter five, second Nephi chapter five, a tale of difficulty after difficulty after hard work and sacrifice. And then in verse 27, I love this and I'll end with this. After all that struggle, it says, and we lived after the manner of happiness. Brothers and sisters, let's pray for revelation. Let's be of a good courage. <laughs> Answer our calls, right? God will equip you to do. And on that journey, you discover yourself, your need for his grace, and, and end up doing things that we've never done before. Who knows? In my case, doing things that no one had ever done before, right? Inspire and serve people along the way. And in so doing, we live after the manner of happiness. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Brad, <clears throat> Brad, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. You just had such a such an interesting history on your own. And I love how you said that that it's not, it's not necessarily, let me just look at my notes, that it's it's discovering or almost remembering who we already are, that it's not, we're not trying to necessarily become something new because we already are this person. And, and through Heavenly Father's help, through the Spirit, through the Savior, the grace of the Savior, we're able to, to rediscover or remember who we already are. I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, if, if you think about the, the, the wording in the Pearl of Great Price, we have never begun to exist. We, we we were in the beginning with God and there was no beginning. We've always existed. Th that right there gives us a, a self-worth boost right there, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I love how you said face your laziness. I think, I think sometimes we get really, we're working really, really hard in one area and trying to do things in one area that we forget these other areas that we become lazy in. Mm. And like thinking, oh, maybe I need to start working on this area now and this area because we we forget and we come become lazy in other things. And so I think facing your laziness in all things is that's a great concept. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the stairwell moment really resonated with me, and the words that come to my mind often are what Joseph Smith said when he said, "Oh God." Where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? How long will thy hand be stayed? And I think about that's the stairwell moment where we're like, I don't think I can do this. Hello, are you there? And um, it's in those moments that we really 
as we go inward and we search heavenward, we find those truths that we were always capable and we were always able to do it. We just needed to open up to that, to who we really are. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, one of the articles that um, um, added up all of the broken bones along the way and said, Brad has broken more bones than records. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's us, okay? This is our story, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. God could have taken all the heart away, but we would have missed the the profit, right? We would have missed the benefit. So yeah, all of us get to break more bones along the way than records. And that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Well, uh, well, Brad, thank you so much for, for sharing your personal experience and helping us see how we can know our worth and remember our worth that's that's always existed. And thank you to, to all three of you, to Tiffany and Wendy as well, for, for being on tonight's fireside. Like I mentioned before, this has just been an amazing, an amazing way to start off the new year. So thank you so much for sharing your feedback, your thoughts, your testimonies, your stories, and your personal experiences. Because at least for me, and I hope for all those who are watching at home, it's definitely been, been a, a perfect way to begin this new year. We'll go ahead and close things up with a closing prayer. But before we do... Just like we have in in previous weeks, we'll hang out, hang out and chat for a few minutes after the closing prayer. And again, if you haven't downloaded the Our Turtle House app already, go to turtle.link slash app and you can get that app for free. There's so much content for free and you can upgrade if you'd like. But right now you can get Meg Johnson's most recent turtle talk called Visions of Success. It's a great talk to listen to about knowing your worth and setting realistic and, and goals with God for this new year. So thank you again so much to all of you who are watching at home. And thank you again to our speakers who have been with us tonight for sharing your testimonies and your thoughts about this, this amazing topic. So with that, we'll close things up with our closing prayer by Wendy. Our Father in heaven, we are truly grateful for this opportunity we have had to share our stories and to fill of thy spirit and thy love for us. We are so grateful for all the many ways that thou dost bless us. We are grateful for the truths that we know and for the love that we feel from thee daily. Please help us to remember who we are as, as we progress through this new year to stay strong and to serve those around us and love ourselves and love our neighbors. And protect us, Father, and please bless those who are ill or in need of thy comfort. Bless those with them with healing and with thy love. We are so grateful for thy son and his sacrifices for us. And we love thee so very much, Father, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again to all of you who for being with us tonight. This has just been so much fun. And I've got a question that uh, kind of goes along with since it's the beginning of the new year. And forgive me for kind of putting you on, on the spot. But if there was one thing that uh, one fun thing that you want to, to make sure happens in 2021, because 2020 <laughs> was kind of a doozy. <laughs> if there's one fun thing that you want to have happen in 2021, what would that be? Well, I turned 40 this year and I have my, yeah, and it's my 15 wedding anniversary, 15 year awesome. wedding anniversary. So within like two days of each other, those two big things happen. And Whoa. we had planned to do a Europe trip and then COVID happened and all the things that come with it. So we are currently regrouping, trying to figure out how are we going to make this a beautiful experience. And we have about six months, but that's that's my big like milestone for the summer. Going to make it amazing. So, I love it. That's so yeah. cool. That is so cool. Congratulations, too. That's huge. Thank you. Years and forty years around the sun. That's yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's, cool. that's so cool. So for us. Um, 
we were going to go to New York last year and then that didn't happen. And, um, but we decided, so our son is 13 and he, he's obsessed with anything Disney. And the last time we took him to Disney world was when he was three. And so he really doesn't remember it at all. And so, um, instead of trying to plan for New York this year, we decided because he's old enough and he can remember it and he really wants to go back to Disney world. Um, our goal is Disney world. We're hoping that will happen. I <laughs> um, love it. That will be our fun, fun, exciting thing for the year. If, oh, when it happens. I'm not saying if, I'm saying when. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Tell a different story. I love that. Tell a different story. <laughs> I love that. I grew up in California and, uh, and I only went to Disneyland with my family once growing up. And it was right wow. around the same, same time when I was about three. And so growing up, the only memory I had of Disneyland was eating a churro. For some reason, I remember sitting in like the, one of the plazas, eating a churro and uh, going on the Peter Pan ride. So, oh, I, I love the Peter Pan ride. ride. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's awesome. I love that you guys are going to go back there. That's so cool. Disney World. What I about saw you, Brad? maybe not so funny meme on social media. Um, it had, I think, of Will Smith. Anyway, it's, it says um, something like, uh, um, are you kidding me? The next year coming up is 2021. <laughs> w O N, right? <laughs> I mean, that's funny. Oh. It's sad too. So, uh, two things uh, to leave with, right? <laughs> Let's not let 2020 win. Okay? <laughs> it didn't win, right? It didn't win. In 2021, we win. Okay, through grace mm -hmm. and through courage, we win. How's that for an affirmation? Um, and um, uh, uh, Tiffany, I turned 55 in, in April. Okay. And I still feel I prayed a lot about this, and this is not a, you know, some uh, s some uh, ego trip that I'm on. Right. This is. I still feel like I'm supposed to do this, and. Um, there, no one, no human being has, has ever run a mile under 435 after 55 years of age. And um, that's that's one of the to-do lists I've got. I want to run under 420, 435 in the mile. Wow. That would be that is awesome. awesome. Mm -hmm. That would be, be so cool. I love that. So for, for you to do that, it's got to be a certified race, I assume, right? Or is it... Yeah, it could be anything as long as you've got a timekeeper or it's a great question. There are there are 12 separate uh, things that have to happen. Only one of which is is uh, running the time. So, yeah, it's very, very, uh, you know, uh, tedious and, and complex. And there are people there's someone that ran an M60 world record last year and it doesn't count because they didn't hit a do a. a of a, a test for the automatic system before this race, the race oh, started. Oh, so yeah, it's very wow. yeah. Shoot. Um, Just to verify that the times, the time system was working correctly. One of the challenges is, um, <laughs> is finding me. races, finding even races, right? Will there be an, right. A, a, right, a, yeah. a track season? I might be all dressed up with no place to go. <laughs> 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 this is going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So, have have fun in Europe and and have a blast in uh, in Walt Disney World at uh, Disneyland. Oh, that's so yeah. fun! That's so fun! I love that. I think we're spend this time with with the three of you. And uh, yes, you with the, 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 the tonight. This hey, is Mark. The, yeah. Before we go, can I show you these guys? Yes, I I didn't include this in your in your bio, but uh, <laughs> Wendy, one of Wendy's, she's got sugar gliders. Check out the how you got two or is that three? Two, two. A mom oh and my her. gosh! And they've been sitting here in my lap the whole time, keeping me calm. Uh, what are their names? Mama and Sugar. <laughs> Mama and Sugar. Oh, I love it. That's so cool. That's so cool. I just oh. have to show them off because they're so cute. <laughs> yeah. How long have you had those? Oh, about three years now. They say they can live up to fifteen years. So wow. Yeah, they're like getting a dog. That kind of commitment. <laughs> just yeah. What what is what's care for them like? What do they? What are they um, they're actually nocturnal, so they sleep all day, and then at night we feed them, so they get fed one time a day, and they come out and play at night, and 
Um, so the, usually around nine or 10 at night, that's when we'll play with them. So they're really easy, but we, we have a pouch. So they're in a little pouch and we can wear the pouch around with us. It has a, you know, a oh my God. we can take them with us everywhere and they just sleep in the pouch. And um, that's how they bond with you is they get to know your scent. And um, it's pretty cool. They're fun little pets. <laughs> so cool. Wow. Now, are they the ones that, that will jump from thing to thing or, okay. Yeah, we just don't, when we want to play with them like a lot, we put up a little pup tent in our living room because yeah. I don't want them getting lost in my house. <laughs> so we'll put them in the tent so then they can jump and climb and everything, so. Oh, that's fun, that's fun. I had a, I had a gerbil, my sister had a gerbil and then she gave it to me. And so we had it for a year or something like that. And it got out of the cage a couple of times. And that was oh. always, that was always the worst when you're trying to find basically a rat. <laughs> yes. Oh man. That's so cool. Thank you so much for sharing sugar, sugar and mama with us. Yes. I love that. You're sugar welcome. <laughs> yes, sugar. Love That's so cool. Tiffany, Brad, do you guys have any pets or anything or? I have 10 chickens and two wow. dogs. Yeah. And two dogs? Yeah. Yeah, so I have three Polish chickens that have like the giant afro on top of their head. Yes, and amazing. they act like they, I don't know, it's almost like the, they're the three that are the really arrogant part of the flock. And then everyone else kind of sticks together. But these ones are over here having their own little social gathering. Oh, and, yeah, so oh, we yeah. love having chickens. That's awesome. They lay, lay, do they lay eggs, I assume? They do. Yep. We're, it's chilly where we are now. So we've got a heat lamp on them and we were getting about nine eggs a day and we're down to about five. Some of those ladies are just not pulling their weight during the winter. Come Taking on. a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. What kind of dogs do you have? Uh, we have a German shepherd and we have a Yorkie. So she's oh, like this big. And then our big one is, you know, this big. And yeah. The big one, the big one thinks the little one is a squeak toy. She likes to try to pull on her little sweater and drag her around. And <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. Dogs you, know, chickens as well. you have chickens too? Yeah, we do. And then oh. kind of like doodle like everybody else, right? <laughs> I love it. 68 uh, beehives. So. Oh, wow. so yes. I was going to ask you about that, Brad. What, sure. what, living as a beekeeper like that's something that i found so interesting and and uh, just don't know enough about yeah it's an amazing hobby i think everybody would be beekeepers if you knew how fun it is it's it's just absolutely a blast and um and then i've taken you know two as a hobby and six as a little nuts and i've got i've got 68 hives so my wow. bees right now are in nevada uh, for the winter and then in a month and well five weeks from now they go into the almonds, um, actually, we have a church contract, so they're going to make some some uh, some Mormon almonds. <laughs> awesome! So we've got how do you the track food. them? How do you like? How do you track where they're at? Um, well, you, they, or do you move the them? Audience. So we, okay, you, you move them. We move them on semis, and then once okay. uh, once they're placed, it, we do it in, in the in the night. And then when they wake up in the morning, they, they orient and then they know where they live again. And then they'll work in the almonds for about three and a half uh, weeks and making almonds for a, a, the church, our church in, a, in, a, in a, a church owned um, um, almond grove. And then we'll put them on the semis and bring them back to, to Utah. And then I sell wow. bees, I sell honey and just have a blast. And my kids oh, are wow. cool. it's just been fun. That's so okay. cool. I've heard that that you can tell that you know beekeepers that are or people that work with bees a lot that you can tell when when they're dangerous, when they're not dangerous, and that at least on YouTube, <laughs> so I've seen people, I've seen people, beekeepers or whatever, just be so calm. Like the bees are so calm that they're just scooping them with their hands and stuff like that. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, bees are bees are nice. They don't bees don't sting unless they do. <laughs> Sometimes Somebody write that down. Yeah, yes. I think that's applicable to a lot of things that live in life. Yes. Little toddlers. Toddlers are nice until they're not. <laughs> until they're not. Until they're not. Oh, Teenagers. Uh, this works every time, right? Oh, oh, that's that. funny. Yeah. Mark, yeah. thank you for hosting this. And no, thank you guys yeah. so much for being yeah. on here tonight. And, and to those of you who are still watching at home, thank you so much for being with us on tonight's Fireside. 
we'll go ahead and wrap things up and hope that you have a fantastic year. This is uh, we've, we've been through a lot over the last 52 weeks and uh, and but we've made it through. We've made it through. And we hope that the 2021 is the start of seriously your best year ever. So thank you so much to all of our speakers and to all of you at home who support these firesides. And we'll see you next week on another Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. Bye. Thank you.